But um, thanks for thanks everyone for coming to the first Girl to the Moon webinar. Um, I'm curious if anyone, you in the audience, might be the first Girl to the Moon. So I'm Randy Sullivan. I'm a senior at Miller High School. I, I created this webinar for my senior capstone project with help from my amazing um, subject mentor, Sharon Allen. Thank you, Sharon, again. And I was inspired to create this webinar because growing up, I always learned about different men in the space industry, like Neil Armstrong or Alan Shepard. And I never really learned about girls in the space oh industry, like uh, Kristen Callis and Sally Ryder. And I wanted to create this webinar um, for girl, young girls in my community and anyone who wants to join, really, to show uh, female role models in the space industry. So they know, so you guys know that it's a possibility for you. Even if you don't want to join the space industry yourself, just so you can know you can do anything you want. Even if you usually see men doing it, girl power right there. Um, I, I also personally want to join the space industry and follow all these amazing women's uh, footsteps. I want to be an aerospace engineer and create rocket ships for the NASA or SpaceX when I'm older. And before I start, I just want to thank all the panelists again for being here. I want to thank Carrie, Juliana, Jenna, and Kimberly for taking time out of your day to talk to everyone. It's very much appreciated. And I want to thank um, Nadia, Catherine, and Sharon again for helping me with this webinar. And I want to thank the Center of Astrophysics at Harvard Smithsonian for co-hosting. And uh, we will be taking questions at the end um, via the chat feature. So you can type your questions in then, or if you have them as we are going on, we won't answer them till the end, but you're welcome to do if you don't want to forget it. And we do have limited time, so we will not get to everyone's questions. Um, but for now, let's kick it off with Carrie. Okay, can we see and hear me? You're good, Carrie. Right, thanks very much. Hi everyone, I'm Carrie Hayworth. It's really great to see so many people here on this call. It's a fantastic thing. Um, I'm an engineer at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. Um, and on the upper left is a view from my office or was now uh, the lower right is the view from my office because um, like a lot of people I am working from home. Um, I've also worked at the MIT Kavli Institute, which is right down the road, and I'm going to talk to you about a couple projects uh, that I worked on from both of these institutions. So first of all, I'm an engineer, so it's an electrical engineer. We'll get into a little bit about what that means. But one question is, what does that mean? Well, I work with a lot of scientists, and these scientists, they have questions about just in general, the universe and the way it works. And so this scientist is asking the question, are there planets around other stars? Can I see a black hole? And an engineer, and that's what I do, has to think of, okay, how can we answer that question? We're gonna need tools. And what tools can we use in order to answer that question? And so, in fact, this engineer is saying, okay, well, maybe I'm gonna to need to build a satellite or maybe I'm gonna to need to design a telescope, something, how can I answer these questions? And so that's what I do. Um, and in fact, although this is not me, it does look a lot like my lab. And so, and Brandy showed this really good picture, it looks a lot like this one, of all the planets in our solar system. And that's a really exciting thing. You know, we all love our planets in our solar system. Um, but one of the things that, that scientists have asked, I mean, this, this is our sun, and it's really a star, like all the stars that you see in the night sky. And so one of the things that uh, a lot of astronomers and scientists have asked is, well, what about all the other stars? We have planets around our star. But do all of these other stars have planets around them? Do any of these stars have planets around them, like our planets? Um, especially, are there any planets out there like Earth? And so what I helped to build was this MIT satellite, whose name was TESS. And what it is doing is it's looking for planets. And so it's looking all over the galaxy, all over the universe, it's going all the way around um, both the north and the south to see all the planets that it can find that are close to us. And so it has four cameras on it. You can kind of see all four of them. And it takes pictures with those cameras. And then here, it sends these pictures to the scientists down on Earth. And they look at the pictures and try to figure out, are we seeing planets? Um, and actually, Juliana is going to talk to you a little bit later about how they do find planets um, from the data that's coming down. 
And so if you look on the lower left here, this is one of the instruments that I worked on. And you can't actually see it if you could look behind this sunshade here. A sunshade is the same thing that you do when you shield your eyes like this um, so that, that you can look at something without getting the sun in your eyes. Well, cameras have to have the same thing. Um, and so this is actually behind those. And so it's collecting the data from the cameras, as I said, sending it back down to the scientists. And so we were able to get answers. There are planets around other stars. And in fact, TESS has found 113 planets around other stars so far. Um, this is a picture that was actually sent down from uh, TESS. And these are all stars. This is something you can't see from Earth because of all the light and the atmosphere. But when you get out past the moon and that's where TESS is, you can see all kinds of stars. And here's an artist's picture of one of the stars and one of the planets that we found, what it would look like um, based on what we've learned about it. So another question that we've asked is, okay, we, we think that light falls into a black hole, right? That's why you call it a hole, things fall into it. And in fact, even light falls into it, which is a weird thing for us to think about on earth. But the question was, can we see a black hole? So an artist drew this picture, but we hadn't actually seen one. We thought that's what it would look like. And so, well, we want to look really far out in space at the black hole. We can't do it with our eyes. You could get a big telescope. A big telescope is like a big eye, basically. But even a really, really big telescope isn't enough to see a black hole. So we had to be even more thoughtful and think, well, what if we started putting telescopes from all over the world, all looking at the same place that we think this black hole is, and all together add up all that they're seeing and say, do we see a black hole? And so these were all the telescopes that were put together looking at one place and they looked for the black hole. And sure enough, we did see a black hole. And actually there's a picture behind me of that same black hole that we saw. And so that was really exciting for the first time we were able to see that. And in fact, it got onto all the newspapers and maybe some of you even saw it in the newspapers. But we know that black holes don't stay still. We know that they're moving. This is a picture, but it doesn't show how it's moving. So the next thing we wanna do is make videos of a black hole, actually see it move. And so it's gonna require some more engineering. And so here's something that I'm working on right now in my lab. If you could see behind me, then you would see that this is, this is a board that's actually on my, on my desk right now. Um, but this is some of the technology that we're going to be using at these telescopes, all these telescopes that you saw, that will make us black hole movies. So we will be able to see how the black hole moves around. And so that's some of the stuff that as an engineer you could do if you wanted to work with the space program. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, I believe Julian, Julian is going, coming next, and she can tell you a little bit more about the science. Thank you, Carrie. All right, I'm ready. Can I share my screen now? Go for it. Great. Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? I see a lot of you have cameras on. Give me thumbs up if you're doing well. Yeah, I see a lot of thumbs up. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys to do that so I, so I can tell that you're all glued to the screen and paying attention. All right, so my name is Juliana. Oh, actually, let me share my screen first. All right, so first, can you all see my screen? Oh, wait. Can you share screen? All right, let's do this one over here. Play. Can you all see my screen? Give me thumbs up if you can see my screen, everyone. All right, awesome. Oh, all right. My name is Juliana Garcia Mejia, and I am a PhD student. I'm a fourth year PhD student, so I, I'm a lot older than all of you, but I grew up, when I was your age, I was living in a magical place called Colombia. And Colombia, for those of you who don't know, is located in South America. So we're somewhere around here in North America. It's located in South America, right around here in this corner. And this is kind of what I grew up seeing. I grew up around mountains, coffee fields. And at night, because there's not a lot of light pollution, you could see tons and tons of stars in the sky. And so when I was your age, I spent a lot of time talking to my uncle about this one question that he was very intrigued in and he made me fall in love with. And that question was whether or not we are alone in the universe or whether there is life elsewhere in the universe. So I'm curious to hear if any of you have ever thought about this question. Give me some thumbs up if you have and give me some thumbs down if you haven't. All right, so we have we have lots of mixes. All right, 
So I started thinking about this question and I'm so lucky that now as a PhD student, I get to dedicate all of my days to, to help humanity get closer to an answer to this question. So how do we go about this as astronomers? Well, there's two ways we can go about it. So one way we can go about it is to look for signs of life in the planets inside the solar system, like Carrie was telling us. And the, um, so right, I have over here is a representative picture of the solar system. This is of course not a real picture of the solar system, but we have, we have tons of missions that have gone to places like Mars and the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, in, and these are rovers and orbiters that have gone really close to those planets to get us really, really good information and see if we can piece this together. And I don't know if you guys heard about a little very, very perseverant rover that launched last week, or I think it was two weeks ago at this point. And here's an animation of the Mars rover landing, the, the Perseverance rover landing. And this rover is actually going to be dedicated to trying to find and get us closer to finding an, an answer of whether or not there's life elsewhere in the universe, because this crater where it, is, um, where it was um, sent to is the place that scientists think is the most promising to find, to help us find life. So we can go about it, answering this question of whether or not there's life in the universe by staying in the solar system. However, a lot of scientists like me are very, very interested in trying to make that search bigger. So let's take it out of the solar system like Carrie was telling us, and let's go to that. Let's go and look everywhere in the Milky Way that we can. So this is the Milky Way right here. And this is a real time lapse of the, of the Milky Way from the south of South America. So down there somewhere in Chile. And a lot of scientists like me are doing a lot of monitoring or of a lot of these stars to try to look for planets around it, but not just any planet, right? Because if we're looking for life, basically we have to start looking for life as we know it on earth. And so the first step in this journey to try to find life elsewhere in the universe for scientists like me is to find the nearest earth-like planets outside of the solar system that have about the same size and the same mass, so they weigh about the same as our own. And of course, like Carrie was telling us, there's missions right now that are fully dedicated to this. So for example, this is an animation of the test satellite that Carrie worked on. Um, and uh, this guy is surveying the entire sky all the time as we're speaking, taking pictures and pictures of all the entire sky to look for these Earth-like planets. But unfortunately, that's a huge task. And if we want to really, really understand these Earth-like planets, we have to keep observing them. Once the test finds them, we have to keep observing them from the ground. And so that's what I've been doing for the past three and a half years now is building an observatory from the ground that's called the Tierras Observatory. And you can see it right here on the screen. This is a video of me moving into the dome to take a look at the telescope on the inside. And that's exactly what this, what this old telescope that I'm rebuilding and refurbishing is going to do. It's going to help us find those Earth-like planets around red stars. And the way that we're going to do that, it uses something that's called the transit method. So the transit method, okay, so we're gonna do a little experiment on the run. So locate a light bulb in your house. Quickly, locate a light bulb. Okay, so now grab your, so let's say the light bulb is a star, right? So now grab your fist and make it like this. So the fist is a planet, okay? So now put the planet in between the light bulb and you. So my question is, did the amount of light that you're getting from that light bulb decrease or did it increase? So do give me a thumbs up if it increased and give me a thumbs down if it decreased. The amount of light that you see decreased, decreased, yeah. That's exactly what scientists do. This is exactly what we're doing. You basically just did, you basically just have all the tools you need now to, di to discover a planet. So I have an animation here. So here's the, here's the star. So this is your light bulb. Here's the planet going around it. And what you're gonna see over here on the left, left, left side of the screen is that at the as the planet passed in front of the star, the amount of light that we received decreased. And that's all we're measuring over and over and over every single night. That's what I'm gonna be doing once I manage to get on sky um, and finish refurbishing the observatory. So basically what refurbishing an observatory means is you have to build a camera for it because at the end of the day, a telescope is just a huge light bucket, but then you actually have to process all that light that you're getting into an image that you can see on a screen. 
And so what I'm doing is I'm building this thing. This is a contraption that I call a camera and it looks really complicated and strange. But all I wanted to point out to you guys is that it's made out of a bunch of lenses. And these are the same lenses that you have in your, in your phones and that you use in cameras. So what a, what a day looks like for me, you can see me over, this is me. I, I don't know if you can recognize me and this is one of my colleagues. What a day looks like for me in the lab is very different. But over here, for example, I get to play with these awesome lenses and put them all together and move them around and align them in very special ways so that they do exactly what I want them to do when I get to install them, hopefully in a few months from now. So that's what my job looks like. That's what we do. And I'm so excited uh, to have as many of you join us in the future. Thank you so much for paying attention. Give me a thumbs up if you agree that this is, this is awesome. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for listening, guys. Hi, everyone. I think it's, it's my turn now. Is that right? I'm Jenna. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to you all today. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, and actually, hang on a second. Uh, shared a bit differently. Um, okay. Uh, so hopefully you can see full screen now. Yes, give me a thumbs up. Okay. Um, so my name is Jenna Samra. Uh, I am an instrument scientist. I'm an astrophysicist technically, but um, a lot of what I do is instrument science. And so um, I'll explain what that is. Uh, you've already heard from an engineer and a scientist, um, Carrie and Juliana, and I'm kind of in between. So I'm a scientist, um, but I, I work a lot with instrumentation. Well, Juliana does as well. Uh, and, and my position is really, um, at kind of the interface of, of the science that we want to do and the instrumentation. Um, but first, I'll tell you a little bit about what we study. Um, I'm a part uh, of a group of scientists to study the outer atmosphere of the sun. Um, so you might be familiar uh, with Earth having an atmosphere. That's, you know, the air that we breathe is Earth's atmosphere. Um, the sun also has an atmosphere. And if I play this movie, um, this is the sun rotating uh, and this is its atmosphere. So it looks totally different than what when you look up um, and you see the sun, if you, if you look with some, some special solar glasses that, that keep your eyes safe, the sun looks kind of flat and boring and maybe you see a sunspot or two, uh, but this is what the, um, the outer atmosphere of the sun looks like. It's very dynamic. There are eruptions happening. It's very, very hot. And scientists are interested in understanding why it's so hot. Um, they're under, interested in understanding and predicting when um, eruptions are going to happen and whether they're going to affect the Earth. Um, and and um, along with eruptions, you may have heard of solar flares. That's another, they're, they're kind of linked, and that's another thing that we're interested in studying. Um, so the outer atmosphere is called the corona. It's called that because it looks kind of like a crown. Um, and, and so that's where the name comes from. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the total solar eclipse uh, of 2017. This happened, um, well, it was uh, th about three and a half years ago in August. I don't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal from Juliana and give me a thumbs up if you, if you got to see <laughs> the eclipse in 2017. So um, I got, uh, a, well, a, during an eclipse, a total eclipse, um, you see the solar corona. So the moon passes in front of the sun it blocks out the bright part of the sun that we see every day. And then you can see it's, it's a very brief opportunity every year, year and a half to see the outer atmosphere of the sun, um, which is really, really cool. Uh, it's really um, a beautiful thing to see with your eye, but it's also a really interesting thing for scientists to see with their telescopes. And so we actually use um, total eclipses as a time to study the sun. And so I got a really unique view um, of the, the 2017 total solar eclipse uh, because I um, was part of a team who built an instrument to observe the eclipse from an airplane. <laughs> so um, we were actually looking out a, a special porthole in the airplane, um, flying along uh, the eclipse path and, and actually measuring the corona um, from, from the air at about um, 47,000 feet which is a little bit higher than you would fly in an airplane um, that you would take to go on vacation. 
Um, and so, so this is this is our instrument. It's called AirSpec, the Airborne Infrared Spectrometer, and it is um, it it is a really really complicated uh, instrument. So we're looking out a a window that's over here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's it's over to the right half of the image. Um, we have to uh, we have to compensate for the airplane's turbulence. So we have to keep ourselves pointed at the sun and the sun is really small things to stay to stay targeting right when um when the airplane is bouncing around and, and moving around like that um so there was a lot of engineering that went into this um and and we had a whole team of scientists and engineers who who um really made this happen uh but my particular job is to kind of connect the science with the engineering so um, we know that uh, we want to study certain things in the corona, and there are scientists who are experts on that, and they understand all the nuances and the ins and outs of um, what we want to learn about. And then there are the engineers like Carrie who can actually build something and, and, and make it work. And then um, there's, there needs to be somebody in between who can kind of link uh, that, that to, to make sure that the, the instrument that is built, the telescope that is built, um, meets the um, the requirements of the science. So we want to be able to um, to kind of see as as um, precisely as we can as we need to and and that's where I come in. Um, so I kind of I'm kind of um, in between the scientists and the engineers and I, I I kind of link those two together. So I work I work a lot with with both groups. Um, so when I was a um, a kid, I, I liked math and science a lot. maybe some of you do too. Um, and uh, and I was I had an interest in astronomy, but then I, I went to college for engineering, and I um I did I, I thought that that would be maybe a way to apply the the math and science, um, even though I didn't know much about it when I when I went. Um, but I realized uh, as I was doing research in my undergrad and my masters um, that I really liked doing the hands-on engineering work, and so. Um, then I got a little bit of experience with telescopes, and um, one thing led to another. I went to grad school um, for for applied physics, but kind of focusing in optics, and um, flew the eclipse flight, and then uh, stayed on at, in in my current job at the Center for Astrophysics. Um, and so now I'm I'm doing a lot of of similar work. So the my PhD project was the the first eclipse flight, but we keep improving the instrument and kind of adding on and building new instruments. And um, we fly them on the National Science Foundation's Gulfstream Five jet. So this airplane behind me, it's um, it's the NSF jet, uh, National Science Foundation. It's run by a an organization called the um, National Center for Atmospheric Research. And so they they have pilots and technicians and mechanics and um, this big hangar that holds the airplane and, and we get to spend a lot of time there when we're getting ready for flight tests. It's a, a lot, a lot of fun. Um, now, um, one of the benefits of observing an eclipse from an airplane is that you can go almost anywhere in the world. And so um, this coming December, there's an eclipse over Antarctica. Uh, it's it's a really hard one to observe if you're on the ground um, because you know it's so cold there and there's not a lot of infrastructure around to um, to set up and 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 give you power to power your telescopes and and so on. But from the airplane, um, it's accessible. So that's what we're planning to do next. And this is a picture of us. Um, you can see the the sun starting to eclipse on my screen here, and this is us operating. In the airplane, and on the right is our is our instrument um, as we're pouring liquid nitrogen into it. Really, really cold. Um, so I just wanted to give you a taste of what it's like in the airplane. It's it's a real, um, a really, really challenging and and kind of terrifying. Um, but it all pays off when you have these the moment that um, that you realize it's working. And so that's that was this moment for us. It closed. Yay! So this was the moment that we realized that um, we could actually point at the sun and keep it in our in our camera. We were um, we were thrilled. We we didn't know exactly whether it was going to work until that moment. Um, so I just want to close by saying that the best part of my job is uh, are the people that I get to work with. Um, and so this is a group of us uh, at the um, the eclipse in Peru uh, in 2019. 
uh, standing in front of the airplane and um, along with some visitors who, who toured the plane. So, um, you know, a shout out to, to everybody who, who helped make these projects possible. It's one of the best things about going into a field like this. All right, thank you. Well, hello, I believe I am next. So let me share my screen. Okay. So hi, everybody. My name is Kim Arkand, and I am a visualization scientist, which means my origin story is a little different than everybody else's. I actually started out in biology. I was studying things like this. Does anyone know what this is? Can anyone take a guess? Thumbs up if you think you know. I really like, I am digging the thumbs up things, by the way, so thank you. Um, so this is actually a tick, and we're looking now, like when I used to study things like this, we would study the stomach contents of a tick. But I actually found that I was more interested in computers than I was interested in staring at bugs. Who knew? So now, essentially, I get to use computers to be able to tell stories about the universe. And the telescope that I get to work with most of all is called the Chander X Observatory. It is one of NASA's great observatories and it gets to study the high energy universe. So energetic and kind of hot things in the universe. And it goes about a third of the way to the moon, which means it's really far. And that also means that it was too far for us to be able to like fix it if something happened or went wrong. So if we want to talk to Chandra, we have to do that from down here on earth by just sending up computer code to be able to talk to it or tell it what to do or to fix or change something. So Chandra gets to look at all of these really fun things like exploding stars, areas around black holes, and colliding galaxies and so, so much more. So the type of work I get to do essentially is making pictures of the universe. And I'm just gonna show you a few of my favorites. So we're looking at things like baby stars and clusters of stars that get to hang out together, stars that are getting old, stars that have exploded and blown themselves up all over the universe, things like pulsars, which are really dense, galaxies of all kinds and all different shapes from galaxies that look like rings to whirlpools, areas around black holes that are these superheated, powerful and energetic jets to really, really massive objects in the universe, like clusters of galaxies. And even sometimes things that look like they're smiling back at us thanks to gravitational lensing. So it's a pretty fun job, but essentially my job is to work with data or information. So the way we get to look at these things in the universe, we point our telescope like Chandra out of them, we record information, we bundle it up in the form of ones and zeros, and then we get to bring it to our laptop here on earth. And so I get to take things like images of exploding stars and create them and turn them into something when we have exceptional data. We can do all kinds of really cool things with them. We can make sometimes a 3D model. Sometimes that means we can make a 3D print so that you can hold a really tiny version in plastic in your hand. Sometimes we can bring it into virtual reality. And this is one of my students. She gets to walk inside this exploded star, which I think is really, really cool. Or hot, I guess, since these are energetic processes. And sometimes we can even translate the information into sound. So we're going to listen to just a little clip of what this sounds like. So all we did there essentially was take the information that we're seeing on the screen and translate into sound. So if you don't have sight, for example, you can hear the information instead of just having to quote, see it. So there are all of these different ways we can translate information of our universe into something kind of cool. So the types of jobs that we've been talking about today are very varied, but I have to say that there's all different kinds of things to do when you're trying to understand the universe and when you're trying to help scientists understand the universe, when you're help, trying to help communicate things. So some jobs might need things like computer science or technology. Some jobs are really heavy into the physics. Chemistry can be really useful for certain jobs, a lot of them. Geology, if you're interested in what other planets look like. Things like biology, there's a whole field of being able to think about and try to understand what biology and other systems for potential life might be like out there in the universe. 
And then of course, things like math, you need to use math to be able to model, for, for example, a 3D version of an exploded star, you use geometry. And then we need people like artists who can help us create illustrations of things when we can't image them directly, such as this type of jet coming out of a black hole. And of course, English language arts as well. So if you're trying to talk about what you're doing, if you're trying to communicate what you're doing, if you're trying to just write papers, there's all different ways to incorporate different fields of study. And probably one of my favorite, but weirdest perhaps is social mediaology, which is a term that I made up, but essentially being able to communicate and talk about these types of things on say Instagram or Snapchat is really fun. And the one time I got to run uh, NASA's Instagram account, which has like 60 million followers. I had to be very careful to use my English language arts very perfectly so that no one would find a little typo in any of my messages and responses during one of the SpaceX launches. So there are many different types of jobs in the space industry, and it requires so many different types of people and career interests to be able to make all of these cool things that we've heard about today happen. And yeah, I hope that means that you'll just take the time to explore what we can all do. And I will stop sharing. Great. Thanks um, for all the speakers for sharing about your jobs. I hope everyone liked hearing about it. Can I get a thumbs up for who wants to work in space or maybe even go into space? Oh yeah, super cool. Okay, so now if any of you guys want to ask questions, you can type it into the chat bar and Nadia, um, Nadia is going to help ask all the questions. So if anyone wants to know if we've seen any aliens or anything, just go right ahead and ask. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We have some good questions coming in so far. Um, and the first one actually is for Kim. Uh, Kim, Anna wants to know if you use Python to make those images or work with the data. Yeah, so I've learned many, many different types of computer languages over the course of my 23 year career so far. And the first things I ever learned was actually HTML to make a web page. And then I went into things like C and Java and all sorts of scripting languages. But today, Python is very, very popular and incredibly helpful. And we actually use some Python scripts to be able to create the data sonification or those sounds that you heard earlier. We do also use various kinds of scripting and languages to make the images as well. It's pretty much like you have a palette of paints in front of you and you need to know which color paint you're gonna be able to choose to make which part of the landscape that you're trying to, to, to paint or to create. And so it's all about figuring out which of those languages or pieces of software will help you get your job done and lead to the result that you actually want to make. Okay, thank you, Kim. The next question, I think I'm gonna throw it at Juliana. Um, Roxanne wants to know how big Mars is, and Juliana, you mentioned Perseverance, the rover, so I thought maybe you could answer that one. Of course, we'll do. So Mars is an oddball, guys. Mars, we don't, we scientists don't understand how it is that we managed to get a planet that is so small and so uh, light. So Mars is actually about half the size of the Earth, and it's only one-tenth of its mass. So this thing is super, super light. However, one thing that's very exciting about Mars is that there's no plate tectonic activity. And what that means is that there's no volcanoes erupting, there's no continents and oceans moving around. And so basically the surface of Mars is as it was billions of years ago. And that's why going to Jezero Crater with the Perseverance rover is so exciting, is because it gives us an opportunity to study that, that um, terrain that's old, that's billions of billions of years old, get in there, take a look at rock samples, and see if maybe there's some sort of evidence that there was life at some point in, in, Mar in Mars. And the other thing that's so exciting is that in learning about whether or not there are signs of old life in Mars, it's unlikely that there is life there right now, we actually can also learn about how life emerged on our own planet. Because believe it or not, we still don't know how it is that life emerged on, on Earth and why it is and how it is that we managed to evolve and be this um, awesome humans that can 
go and explore and try to understand space. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next question, I think I'm gonna ask it to Carrie. Carrie, Lexi would like to know, what happens when something goes into a black hole? Is it a portal to somewhere else or is it a never ending hole? Oh, Lexi, if you're asking that question, I guess I have to design something to find out. Um, we don't know the answer to that yet. Once it, there's something called the event horizon. When we have a, when we say we just took a picture of a black hole, I gotta point the right place. When we say we just took a picture of the black hole, what we're really doing is taking a picture of the event horizon around the black hole. Once you pass that event horizon, you get to go to the black hole. You don't get to turn around, you're going straight into the black hole. And that's even light. And I saw another question that talked about, well, you know, what is a black hole really? Well, it's a place that's got so much gravity, right? Gravity is what holds you down on the ground and so you don't float up. It's got so much gravity that even light falls into it, right? And we really don't know what happens once the light goes in. We don't know, is it destroyed? Does it go somewhere else? We have no idea, but we wanna know that. And maybe that's where I have to do next design that kind of experiment, but we don't know yet. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, so I see another question and I'm wondering if Jenna could answer it. Um, Jenna, Claudio wants to know, how are we going to make a reusable rocket? I think you're on, oh, okay, there you go. So I might not be the um, the best person to answer this. So I, I think if anybody could jump in and maybe Carrie or somebody um, knows more, but I think the, the, the trick, as far as I understand it is, um, although I don't know exactly how it's 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 landing it so that we can we can use it again right and so um one of the things that's um uh that that, that can be challenging is that um earth's atmosphere has so much friction uh that well depending on how far the um the, the rocket uh has to has to come down it it, it could um, it, it needs to be able to survive that without burning up. So that's 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 one problem, and there are a lot more. And if somebody else can give a better explanation, I'd be happy to hear it. Okay, I think I think Carrie would. Do you have anything to add, Carrie? Um, you know, I think Jenna did a really good job there. You know, and that's something that the the people at SpaceX are working really hard on. And if that's something that you're interested in, that that's where you'd want to go. We don't. I don't build rockets, I build things to put onto rockets, right? So, so it's good, it's good when you can reuse them, right? It's good when, when you can send it back up and you can use them again for the next person who wants to put something on a rocket because then you can do that, it's cheaper. But I don't actually build that. It's a really big field and yeah, there's a lot of challenges to that and you may have seen some of SpaceX's great videos. Um, but I would say that if you wanna do that, I know there's lots of people that would like to help you learn how to do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Carrie and Jenna. Um, so I think Kim mentioned exploding stars in her presentation. So I wanna ask this to her. Harper asked, what happens to exploding stars? Oh, that's a great question. So stars are just like people, they're born, they live their lives and then they die. And there's an interesting way that stars can change, right? So if you're thinking about a star like our sun, it's not terribly massive. It's kind of middle-aged, middle-sized star, an awesome star, don't get me wrong, it's great. It's just, it's our favorite because it's so nearby, but it's not the most massive. So if you want to think about exploding stars, you have to think of stars that are much, much bigger than the size of our sun. So when you're thinking of stars that are really massive, what happens is they start to get old and they're running out of fuel, right? And as they're doing that, these elements are building up in their core. And once it gets too heavy, this core just collapses and then star explodes and just spills its guts out all over the universe. But what's really cool about that is that is actually another beginning, if you will, because that stuff, that iron and that calcium and all of the other bits and pieces that were distributed out into the universe, it's then going to essentially become new generations of stars, of planets, of, of people perhaps, right? So I hope if you take nothing else away from what I've talked about today, just that you're all very special because you're all carrying around lots and lots of stardust, literally like the iron that's in your blood and the calcium that's in your bones that comes from previous generations of stars that were really massive and that eventually exploded all out into the universe. So I hope that helps. Thank you, Kim. 
Okay, so we have a question from Rosie and it's for Juliana. Juliana, I think you played a video and she wants to know if that was in your observatory. Yes, so I'm not in my observatory right now. That's where I want to be, <laughs> but the mountain's actually close right now. But yes, that's a video of the observatory. So um, much like Jenna, I am very interested in not only taking the data and doing the science and trying to figure out where those Earth-like planets might be and whether they may or may not exist really close to the to the Earth, but I'm also really interested in building those things. And so one of the things that I was very, very excited about when I started this project was making a bunch of GoPro time lapses and videos um, so that all of you could come with me into, into the observatory, literally like we did during the presentation and, and be a part of it. And that's also why I named the observatory, the observatory Tierras. So Tierras means Earths in Spanish and Spanish is my first language. And so I wanted to make it special and inclusive of the experiences of many young students like you. Thank you, Juliana. So the next question we have comes from Lucy and Ada. Um, she wants to know how many galaxies are there? And I'm not sure which of our panelists is best suited for this one. Does anyone want to take a stab at it? Maybe Kim? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so what I really like thinking about is that you know, we are in the corner of the Milky Way galaxy and our Milky Way galaxy is made up of billions of stars, but there are billions and billions of galaxies out there in the universe. So when you think about how many galaxies there are and then how many stars that are contained in each of those galaxies and potentially how many planets each of those stars or many of those stars might have, the numbers get really big. So it's not just about the galaxies, but it's also about all the stars and the planets and the other stuff that's in them. And also that these galaxies essentially cluster into groups. So we are part of our own local group, if you will, of galaxies as well. So there's kind of like a zip code, if you will, that we all get to have as part of the universe. We have our very own planet and our very own solar system. And then we also get our very own galaxy and our very own group of galaxies. Thank you, Kim. Okay. so. The next question we have comes from Colin, and he wants to know why we name satellites. Does anyone want to take a stab at that question? Oh, I, I can take a stab at that question. So there's a couple of reasons we name satellites because we actually feel very, um, very uh, personal with them. We, 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 we feel like they're our friends. You work so hard on them and you do so much work on them and you spend so much time with them that you start thinking it's a friend of yours. And so not only do we name them, but we have nicknames for them. I always call Tess Tessie. And in fact, I've named my plants Tessie and things like that just because I, I love them. But the other reason that we name it is because they tell us what, we, what they do. So TESS is actually an acronym, which means it stands for something else. And it stands for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is a lot of words. But Juliana explained how, they, how the transiting, how the, the, the planet goes across the sun or the star, right? And exoplanets, that's what we're studying. And survey, which means we're looking at a lot of them. And it's a satellite. You put all that together and that's TESS. And that's why we named it TESS, so people know what it is, but also because we love it. Okay, thank you, Carrie. So the next question's from Jason, and I think I'm gonna ask it to Jenna because she mentioned the sun in her presentation. Jason wants to know how hot the sun is. Oh, that's a good question. And it's a complicated answer um, because the sun has multiple layers. So if you are talking about, um, and I'm, I'm just gonna talk about uh, from the atmosphere out, I'm not gonna talk about the core, which is a, a, whole, a whole separate thing. Um, because I mostly study the sun's atmosphere. If you're talking about the part of the sun that you can look up and see with your naked eye, um, that is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or um, scientists use Kelvin, which is just another temperature measurement unit. Um, that's It's about 6,000 Kelvin, uh, which is really, really hot. Imagine something 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Um, but uh, it turns out that the outer atmosphere of the sun, the, um, the movie that I showed you where, um, where the sun was, was you know, rotating and it was really dynamic and you could see things shooting off of it, that's the outer atmosphere, the corona. 
uh, that's actually million uh, from um, above a million degrees. It, it varies, but um, at the point that you're in millions of degrees, it doesn't really matter whether you're using Fahrenheit or Kelvin or Celsius. Uh, it's just really, really hot, right? And um, so actually, uh, one of the mysteries is um, is why is the outer atmosphere of the sun hotter than the the surface, um, the, the the very lower atmosphere that you see every day? Um, so we're talking 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit versus millions of degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you would think kind of uh, intuitively that when you step further away from, you know, from the star, you, it, it gets cooler, right? Because that's what happens when you back away from, say, a campfire or something like that. That's often used as an analogy. Um, but somehow uh, the, the sun, the corona does the does the opposite. It gets hotter as you get further away from the surface. And so that's one thing that, that scientists are studying. They're trying to figure out where is that energy, um, how is that energy being, being sent into the corona uh, to make it so hot? Um, and so that's something that, you know, way down the road experiments like, like our, um, our airborne experiment, you know, or, or other similar things could, could potentially shed light on. Thank you, Jenna. Okay, so we have a question from Susanna. I'm not sure who to throw this one out to, but let me go ahead and ask it. How are planets different sizes? Would anyone like to explain that? I'm happy to since I'm, I'm, I work on planets. So what a great question. That is exactly what we're trying to figure out. So the bottom line is we don't know. And that's what's so exciting, exciting about the field of exoplanets or planets that are exterior to the solar system is that we're it's a really really new field and you guys are in this you we're living through this amazing time when we're where we actually are going to be able to get closer than ever to answering the question amongst many others of whether there's life elsewhere in the universe but also we're, we're gonna get we're gonna be get closer to be able to understand for example why it is like you were asking asking Susanna why is it some planets are small and others are big well, what, what I can tell you so far is that what we've been what we've been able to piece together so far is that planets that are gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn actually have cores that are about the same size as the Earth and the other terrestrials. It's just that those cores get big enough that they're able to, while they're forming, they're able to grab a bunch of helium and hydrogen gas, and then they get really, really big, and they get really, really massive. And because they're so massive, they can keep all that gas around them, and that, that, that's why they become these gas giants. But with the small terrestrials, it just so happens that they don't get big enough. Their cores of um, iron and their cores of um, silicates and rocks don't get big enough where they're able to grab all of these gases. And so they, they are only able to end up with really small atmospheres. But this is all, all in the works. And I could go into, um, into uh, the what we call the scientific literature and going to papers and talk to scientists tomorrow. And my answer would be completely oh. different. So this is a very, very active area of research. And I think it's awesome that you're already asking this question. Thank you, Juliana. Okay, so this next question, I think it's for one of our engineers. Avery wants to know, how long did it take to make tests? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so it's it's an interesting question, Avery, because you know a lot of people work on a lot of the pieces to see can it be done. We need to make this special camera. Can we make this special camera? And they start to work on it early. So I think all, in all, it probably took ten years. But in actually, when we started to really build the satellite and put it together, it took us about four. And so I programmed on the satellite, and it took me about four years to do the programming. Um, and, and so I, I would, I would say four years, but as I said, you know, lots of people worked on it for, for longer than that. It is a long time. I read your answer. It is a long time, but it's also very exciting once it gets up there. In fact, it's, it's now, it's now, I think, oh, three years old now up there. So. Thank you, Carrie. Okay. The next question is from CW. They want to know how many stars are there in a galaxy? I'm wondering if Kim wants to answer this one. Sure. So yeah, there's typical galaxy like the Milky Way has billions of stars. So again, those numbers can be really cool when you think about 
billions of people on planet earth and billions of stars in a galaxy. And then there are billions of galaxy. And I think what's also really neat when you think about stars is all the many different kinds of them, right? So stars are these glowing balls of gas, like mostly hydrogen and helium. And it's really interesting to think of how different stars can be. So we have our sun, which is, you know, just kind of a chill, normal star. It's never going to explode. It's, you know, that's, that's, Definitely something to make sure you don't have nightmares about stars exploding. Um, but there are all these other stars that can be much more massive and also much less massive. And they're all equally interesting. So stars that explode are really neat to study because I mean, who doesn't wanna study something kind of like spreading all out through the universe, but also less massive stars in our sun that are called like brown dwarfs, which seem like they might not be super interesting, actually are because they live a really, really, really long time. Like some of them might be able to live for like, I don't know, 50 billion years. That's an amazing amount of time. So just being able to think about all of the stars that are in a galaxy and all the many different kinds there are, it's really fun stuff to think about. Thank you, Kim. Okay, this next one's a fun question and I'm wondering if several of our panelists can answer. Um, Violet wants to know, is it hard to get a job in space or related to space when you get out of college? So maybe a few of you can share your experience on your, your first job after college that was related to space. Well, I, I, I think that, first of all, it really depends on, are a lot of people excited about space? Because if a lot of people are excited about space, then people want to spend money on space. If people want to spend money on space, then we need more things to go into space. If we need more things to go into space, then we need more people to work on them. And then it becomes very easy. I will say that right now, yeah, we're looking for, for engineers right now who want to work on space. And yes, we, we, we definitely need them. Um, I found it very easy to get into the space industry when I got out and, and I left it for a while. And when I came back in, I found it easy to get in. They really do need people that are interested in working on it and really excited about it. And that's the most important thing really for, for, for getting a job in space. But I'm sure my uh, colleagues have other ideas too. Yeah, I, I think that um, I agree. It was also um, relatively easy for me to get a job in, in, in space, but I started when I first came out of um, college, I was actually working in the defense industry, um, and, but at a place that did a lot of research and some of the research they did was space. So I would say that um, it, it's especially easy to find sort of space adjacent jobs where um, you could be um, doing this, especially if you're on the engineering side, you're doing a lot of similar engineering that might not be for space applications, um, but it really prepares you for a career in space. And that can be a really nice launching pad, <laughs> no pun intended, um, like to, uh, to, to set yourself up if you can't find a job in space um, coming right out of college. I didn't actually try, but um, I ended up in this job. Uh, you can you can sort of um, you can you can segue there uh, you know through an intermediate job that, um, that that gives you the same kind of skills. Now that's from the engineering side. Uh, from the science side, I, I have less experience because my my schooling was mostly in engineering. But maybe um, one of the scientists can answer. Anybody else, sir? Oh, sure. Um, so I, I looked out this job that I have now was the first job that I got out of college, um, but it was just a really good um, situation of being in the right place at the right time with the right skills. So I, I think, as I mentioned, came from biology, and then I went into computer science because I just was fascinated with learning how to code. And that combination of skills just turned out to be exactly what was needed for the Chandra mission at exactly that time. Um, so I was very, very lucky. But I have to say that you know, there are all sorts of people that I work with in my group. We have people who used to be a journalist and now they do coding to help make sure all of the, the web pages and applications are running properly. And we have people who like majored in French and now they do different kinds of application development for us. And we have artists and all sorts of people from many different kinds of backgrounds. So it really is about trying to figure out what your strengths are and then figuring out how you could apply those strengths to a job in, for example, the space industry, if, if that's what you're interested in. But it's a very, very varied field and lots of different people are needed to be able to make things successful. 
Okay, thank you, Kim. So I think we have time for two more questions. Um, this next one is from Juliet. She wants to know how many Earth-like planets has NASA found so far? Does anyone want to take that one? Carrie, do you want to take it or do you, do you want me to take it? No, you go ahead, Julia. Okay, so the question is how many Earth-like planets has NASA found, period? Okay, so that's also a really, really tricky question because what happens is that um, the method, this method that I told you guys about with your with your fist and the light, this transit method, only allows us to get one piece of, well, one or two pieces of information about the planet. But the one piece of information that it's really, really good at helping us get is the size. So you can get a, so, so based on what we can get from the transit method, I think the answer is we have found up to date about six systems with Earth-like planets. So that doesn't mean that we found six planets. That actually means we found more because in some of these systems of planets, um, there's something like four or even five Earth-like planets. So we're talking, so I don't know exactly the number, but it's something like in between um, 12 and 14 planets that have about the same size as the Earth. Now, the trick is though, we also have to get the mass of those planets, right? Because not only to for to get a planet that is as our Earth, we not only needed it to be as big as the Earth in size, but we also needed to weigh about as much to be about as massive. And um, in that, and that task is a little bit harder to do because the method is a different method that we use for it. And sometimes it's very, very difficult to measure. And so planets that have been confirmed to be exactly the same size and mass as the Earth, I dare say there's none of them right now. So really the race is on for the for a real, real Earth twin. We're getting close. There are some that are a little bit more massive. There are some that are a little bit smaller, um, but not yet an Earth twin. There's a, there's a website that you can look at to, to look at, well, there's a lot of websites you can look at for this, but there's one of them, maybe I should put it in the chat, an idea might put something in the chat, um, yeah. that just shows that, I'll put it in the chat right now. Um, this is the planets that Tess has found so far. Now, Juliana was talking about Earth-like planets. Now, ones that are just like Earth, not the same, right? But she said, hey, there's other planets that we found. And so you can look on there and it'll tell you how many, how many Tess has found. And there's other missions that are also looking for planets. So there are lots and lots of people are looking for planets. We're really interested because maybe it'll tell us that someone else is living on another planet. And that's what we really all want to learn. Okay, one last question before I turn it back over to Randy. Um, this one was from Violet, or no, I'm sorry, Natalia. She wants to know, do any of you want to go to space one day? Well, I, I would love to just say, nope. <laughs> so I, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was really little and my parents were super sweet and did not discourage me. However, I could not go on like the tilt-a-whirl at an amusement park. That's how sad and pathetic my stomach was. So eventually I realized that going into outer space would not be for me. And I am totally fine being on planet earth, but lots of other cool people do get to go to space much cooler than me. Yeah, I would say the same um, for a similar reason. Well, besides just being sort of terrified to go into space, I, I also uh, get a little bit of motion sick even on the airplane. So I think it wouldn't it wouldn't work um, for me to be an astronaut. And and I really also um, more seriously like really like uh, kind of studying things from afar. It's a, it's a real challenge to um, to to have to you know do what you because you're not in space actually studying something right there next to it um, to actually build telescopes and, and, and instruments to collect the light for you and, and do it for you. That's its own kind of fun challenge. So I like doing that. All right, Is, does any, any other of our panelists want to answer that one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so we'll see. This is the first time I'm saying this publicly, but yes, I'd love to go to space. That'd be so fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd turn it down either. Somebody offered me a trip to space. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Randy. 
Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming. And do you know what? I want to turn it over to you guys. Do any of you guys want to go to space? Give me a thumbs up if you do. Ooh, I see a lot of potential astronauts in the future. And as the title is, I hope um, maybe one of the girls here can be the first girl on the moon or um, the next boy to the moon. And also we have not had anyone on Mars yet. So maybe one of you guys can be the first person on Mars too, and that'd be super cool. So I, I wanna thank everyone for coming and I wanna thank the panelists so much for presenting and I wanna thank Catherine, Sharon and Nadia for helping out and of course the Center of Astrophysics. And I, I hope you guys enjoyed it and have a wonderful night. And when you, when you go to sleep tonight, just remember that stars make beautiful sounds like Kim was talking about. Good night, everyone.